Most witches, who were tried and executed, were brought to the attention of the local kirk by so-called do-gooders in the village, a result of whispered tales being passed from one ear to the next. Then that person would be interrogated and tortured, not only to produce their confession, but to give the names of other evildoers in the surrounding area. Very rarely would a confession be given voluntarily and unprompted, which is the case in today's tale of the occult, which looks at the life and mystery surrounding a man who on one strange day during a church sermon called attention to himself and claimed that he was in league with the devil. This is the story of Major Thomas Weir, the Wizard of Westbow. In this video, I will cover the well-known tale or legend of the Wizard of Westbow the way it is known to most people. I will then confront the horrific truth that is masked by history and mythology. This second part will contain some very disturbing acts and revelations. Thomas Weir was born in 1599 in Clydeside near Glasgow. He was descended from a very old and powerful family in the Central Belt, Clan Weir, sometimes known as Weir de Vray. His father was the Laird of Kirkton, and his mother was Lady Jean Somerville, a person who was surrounded by much mystery. It was said that the lady had unnatural powers, a prescience of thought, and a control of the evil eye. But perhaps she is a story for another time. Thomas Weir would grow and quickly join the Scottish anti-royalist army, and as a lieutenant he served in Ulster during the Irish Rebellion of 1641. Weir was a fierce and professional officer who held about himself a dominating aura, a man it would seem destined for leadership. In 1650, he would be granted the post of Edinburgh Town Guard Commander and acquire the rank of Major. It was in this position that Weir would come to oversee the execution of another famous Scottish figure, that being James Graham, the Marquis of Montrose, who had been a general in the Scottish army before changing his allegiance to King Charles I. It was Thomas Weir that would sign and oversee the execution of the so-called Great Montrose. While in the city of Edinburgh, Weir would live with his younger sister Jean, who was more commonly known by the name Grizel. The pair took up residence in West Bow, a street which links the two halves of the city. At one end, the castles and cathedrals, and at the other, the inns and pubs. In Weir's time, the street was well known to house many of the city's most pious citizens, who would actively preach upon the street. These residents would quickly become known as the Bowhead Saints, and chief among them was the angelic Major Thomas Weir. For many long years, Weir had been a devout and somewhat fanatical Presbyterian. He much rejoiced in the Scottish Protestant Reformation and was staunchly anti-Catholic and anti-Anglican. Weir was a powerful and striking figure, tall, thin, and with a dark, grim face. The man would always dress in black, covered head to toe in a long, dark cloak, and everywhere he went, he was known to carry a black thornwood staff topped with a finely carved and detailed human head. In 1669, Weir would retire from his command of the guard and spend every second of his newly found free time preaching. The now old man would openly preach in the streets, working himself up into a trance-like religious frenzy, during which he would force upon the gathered crowd the furious words of God, with each phrase accented by the violent brandishing of his thornwood staff. Thomas was as well respected as he was feared in the community, an old ravenously pious man who demanded respect and strict adherence to religious tenets. But this view of the iron preacher, the formidable base upon which the pillars of the community stand, 
would entirely change one Sunday morning. Much as every other Sunday, the locals would head to church, and as usual, Major Weir stood overlooking the crowd as they found their seats, each of them very well aware of the oppressing look of the old Westbow saint. Then, before the sermon could begin, Thomas raised his blackthorn staff for silence and spewed forth a number of horrifying, demonic confessions. He told the gathered flock of his powers of second sight and compact with the very devil himself. The old man spoke of dark, necromantic rituals to summon spirits and the dead. He told of devious sexual acts with all manner of creatures and beasts, including the demonic master himself. But this was not all. Weir claimed to have seduced his sister, and has been living in a carnal, incestuous relationship with her for many years. The crowd and the preachers were beyond shocked by the man's horrific revelation. With much haste, it was announced that the Major had been struck ill with a serious sickness, and to ignore the confession as the ramblings of a madman. With this said, members of the clergy would quickly escort Major Weir out of the building and straight to the local doctors. Yet within minutes of the congregation's dismissal, the whispers blanketed Edinburgh with the confession of the once saintly man. Although, at that time, many were reluctant to formally accuse such a powerful and pious figure in the community. The clergy and the doctors would thoroughly examine Weir, hoping to find a reason for this sudden madness. But the man was in great health, and would continually repeat his confession, and insisted on the crimes he had committed. The authorities were at a loss with this man, and until the situation was over, the once commander of the town guard would be held in the prison bars of the Edinburgh tollbooth. It was now that the local authorities decided to question Weir's sister, Grizel, in the hope that she could put all of these wild rumours to rest and give her the opportunity to clear her good name, which had been so thoroughly marred by the feral confession. But the questioning of Grizel would only pull the investigators deeper into this maddening tunnel of horror and devilry. The sister would readily admit and expand upon her brother's wild claims. She told of their long, incestuous relationship and how he had been granted the devil's mark at a young age and quickly brought her in to the wicked coven. The pair had learned dark magic and powerful necromancy from their mother during their childhood and both had regular meetings with the devil and beings of the realm of fairy. They would perform rituals and attend great gatherings of witches and devil worshippers, where they both took part in all manner of perverse hedonism. Grizel would then give details on many of these incidents, including one in which the devil himself had appeared at the Westbow House in a grand carriage pulled by six jet-black horses, both of which burned with the undying flames of hell. The beast had come to take the Major and enter into a more deadly and insidious pact. The flaming carriage left with the devil and we as passengers, and it travelled to Dalkeith, where they would meet others and partake in demonic revelry. Upon Weir's return, he had news of the outcome of a battle, some weeks before the official routes would report it to Edinburgh. The pious man's sister also told of how she herself had been visited on many occasions by the she or people of Elfheim. Her brother had been consort of the elven queen for a time, and now the she brought her gifts such as silver and enchanted amulets. On one occasion, she ventured into the land of the Fae and spent some time there talking with the spirits. Upon her return, she found a young Fae woman at work on her spinning wheel, and she had spun more fine yarn that night than ten women working for a week. But the most important fact that Grizel would continually impose upon the authorities was the power that lay within the Blackthorn staff. She told of how he had been given the staff by the devil, and it was that very staff that linked the pair, and how the owner could summon great power to himself. As a high-ranking and well-respected public figure, 
Weir's initial confession was mostly thrown out by authorities, but the testimony of his sister, along with a clean bill of health from medical professionals, would seal the man's fate. It was deemed that Thomas Weir suffered from nothing more than a guilty conscience, and wished to be punished to the full extent of the law. Still with some hesitation, the local authority would have both Thomas and Grizel arrested and formal charges were laid upon them. While being imprisoned, Grizel would warn her jailers of the evil that would befall them if the black staff reached her brother's hand, as with it he could summon to him the devil, and none would resist the beast's terrifying power. The trial itself took place on the 9th of April, 1670. Major Thomas Weir was charged with incest, multiple accounts of adultery naming many local women, bestiality, and finally witchcraft. His sister Grizel was charged with sorcery, witchcraft, and conversing with familiar spirits. The chief evidence against the pair was their own unprompted confessions. The only other statement was made by an older sister of Weir, who denied the household devilry during their young days, but did claim to have seen Grizel and Weir naked in bed on one occasion. Weir told the court that he was indeed guilty of all the charges, and had once lain with the devil in the shape of a beautiful woman. It took the court very little time to return a sentence of death for both the participants of the diabolical schemes. Thomas Weir was sentenced to be strangled at the stake before being burned alive. Grizel, on the other hand, was sentenced to death by hanging. The pair were led from the court and housed in the former leper colony at Greenside. This wait would not be long, as Weir was taken from his cell on Monday the 11th of April, and as he was tied to the stake, a preacher asked him to repent and pray for the salvation of his immortal soul. To which Weir replied, Let me alone, I will not pray, I have lived as a beast, and I must die as a beast. After this, he was strangled and burned alive in front of the baying crowd. As the haunting screams rang out from the burning man, the jailers cast the black thorn staff into the flames, where witnesses claim it twisted and turned like a snake within the fire, and took an uncommonly long time to burn. On the very next morning, Grizel was led from her prison to the gallows, and she also seemed determined not to repent for her sins. In a final burst of energy, as she was led to the rope, the woman tore off her clothes and displayed her naked body, making the scene far more shocking for the pious crowd. Once dead, Grizel was cut down and buried with her brother's ashes at Shrub Hill near Leith Walk. But that is not quite the end of Thomas Weir. The dark necromancer and his lurid tale of demonic orgies seem to have infected the very populace of Edinburgh and given birth to many powerful myths and folk tales concerning the damned spirits of the major and his sister. Many years later, claimed writer and occultist Sir Walter Scott would say, It is certain that no story of witchcraft or necromancy, so many of which occurred near and in Edinburgh, made such a lasting impression on the public as that of Major Weir. Some tell that the dread-looking man in his black cloak can still be heard walking the streets of West Bow, his identity revealed by the tapping sound of the devil-crafted cane upon the cobbled stones, a sound that would strike fear into any of those unfortunate enough to hear it. The staff itself was also believed to have a mind of its own, and tales began appearing about odd instances with the cane, some from even before the man was executed. Locals would tell of the Blackthorn cane walking around on its own or in front of its master, and even running errands and opening doors for the man, like some form of demonic familiar. There were some in Edinburgh that even believed the man's power had grown to such an extent that he was able to return to the living after his execution, and continued to live in the house with his sister, which after the pair's death would lay uninhabited for many years. 
with no one daring to live in such a haunted and evil place. By night, the local pubs were a frenzy of odd stories surrounding the abandoned Weir home. It was said that during the night, candlelight could be seen illuminating the house from inside, along with strange music and haunting laughter. On one occasion, observers would notice the grim countenance of the Major staring out of the window, filled with anger and brandishing the blackthorn cane. But the ghostly apparitions were not only confined to the necromancer, but his sister would appear in the street or house as well. One tale describes how at the stroke of midnight by the clock of St Giles, Grizel would appear opening the window and beckoning thrice with a gnarled extended finger, luring those that beheld the sight to their doom. There is even an account of Weir himself issuing forth from the property at the stroke of midnight, mounted upon a flaming horse with no head, and would gallop off in a whirlwind of flames. There were those that believed the house had become a nexus between our world and the spirit realm, a place where other evildoers would take part in rituals and summonings. Yet most haunting of all were the multiple reports of a large coach drawn by six black horses thundering down the street late into the night. Unsurprisingly, the home would stay empty for many years, left to rot and decay while the fearful public allowed it a wide berth. It was eventually purchased 100 years later, in 1780, by the ex-soldier William Petullo, a man who disregarded the superstition surrounding the home and was more than happy to pay the low price. The second the ink was dry on the documents, rumours flooded the city. The necromancer's home had been bought and someone brave or foolish enough dared to enter. On the first night Petullo and his wife settled in the home, they beheld a fearful sight. As the pair lay in bed, suddenly awoken by a noise in the night, they looked up to see the decapitated form of a calf walk through the stone wall. The beast moved to the bed, and setting its four hooves upon the stock, glared at the pair with the headless remnants of its bloody maw. The ex-soldier and his wife screamed in terror, and ran with all speed from the bedroom, not wishing to be devoured by this evil phantom. The pair fled the house, and once more it was abandoned and left to the whims of the demonic spirits that lived within. Eventually, the house was demolished, and the evil of the great wizard and his witch sister was destroyed forever. Or so many believed, I amongst them. But while researching this video, I found some new information that tells a very different tale. One of the reasons it was believed the house was entirely gone was its mention by Sir Walter Scott in 1830, when he said, the remnants of the house in which Weir and his sister lived are still shown at the head of West Bow, which has a gloomy aspect, well suited for a necromancer. At the time I am writing, this last fortress of superstitious renown is in the course of being destroyed. But 200 years later, in 2014, it was discovered by Dr. Bondison of Cardiff University that the building was mostly incorporated into a Quaker house, a place of religious meetings, in what is now Victoria Terrace. The manager of the meeting house, a Mr Buxton, had this to say. This is the first time I have been told Major Weir's home was actually here. I thought it had been demolished by people who didn't want anything to do with it. That said, one of my staff some years ago said he had seen Weir walk through the wall. If Dr Bondison is right, Weir's house is in our toilet, which seems appropriate. Appropriate or not, it would seem that the hellish nexus to the spirit world and the desecrated ground once walked by a man now known as the Wizard of Westbow still haunts Edinburgh to this very day. Thank you for listening, and a special thank you to my patrons for allowing me to bring you these tales. We will now look at the truth behind this strange tale and delve even further into the pits of hell, which I warn you now covers some very disturbing topics 
including sexual abuse, and I will take no offence if you choose to leave the video now. The first issue is that very few people know the truth behind this tale, and that the general folklore or legend version I told you is not entirely correct, although both may have the same outcome. The unmasking of Weir's hideous deeds may not have been quite as theatrical as many stories might lead you to believe. It was said that after retirement, Weir began to fall ill, and from his sickbed would confess to friends and local clergymen of his secret life of adultery and incest, with no mention of witchcraft or devilry. These sinful acts would quickly reach the ear of Andrew Ramsey, the Lord Provost, who found the confession implausible and took no action. But eventually, both Weir and his sister were taken for interrogation. And this is where Grizel told of necromancy, witchcraft and the devil. So it would seem that the religious man's church confession may have been added later due to the elaborate retellings of local storytellers, or to conceal the truth which would show the vast negligence of the local authority and church who it would seem had their part to play in the horrors that would come to light. It is said in some records that Weir was never officially charged with witchcraft, but only of incest and adultery, with his sister being the one charged with sorcery. But then I found the actual court proceedings, and a truly horrifying picture was painted of Thomas Weir. Weir was indicted and accused of adultery, incest, bestiality and rape. It was said that this first occurred when Weir did enter the room of his sister Jean Weir, later known as Grizel, when the girl was but ten years old, and would entice and forcefully defile her, Thomas at this time being well into his twenties. Sadly, this would occur again on a yearly basis, until the girl was sixteen. Then the abuse would become far worse, and would begin to happen on a weekly basis, while they both lived in their father's house. This nightmare would continue for the next 46 years, as Grizel was forced to live with and accompany her abuser throughout life. It was also said that Weir used his standing and power within the church and the town guard to force multiple women into sleeping with him, and this along with the horrible treatment of women at the time would mean that the many recorded accusations of harassment and sexual abuse submitted to the authorities were entirely overlooked, and the women deemed to be suffering some form of madness, since no one thought it possible that the leading saint of Westbow could have committed these atrocities. Many would even believe that this was some form of conspiracy to mar the pious man's good name. One accusation that did come to light was that of Margaret Borden, the daughter of Weir's temporary wife with the same name. Weir's stepdaughter told the court that the man raped her multiple times when she was a child, and that this happened during the time of her mother's illness and again after her mother's death. Weir would continue this horrible act until eventually he forced the young girl to marry an Englishman for a healthy dowry. The Major was also charged with keeping the then 22-year-old servant Bessie Wemus as a form of sex slave. She was trapped in his clutches due to his influence and power, and the fact that he could easily destroy her life if she would dare go against him. This would allow the man to control and force his servant into submission. In 1650 and 1651, at a farm in New Mill, Weir would commit bestiality with a mare, a cow, and some other beasts. These specific acts were actually witnessed by a local woman, whose name is unknown, but she did report the crimes to Mr. John Neve, Minister of New Mill. But unfortunately, the woman was turned away, and her testimony was disregarded as lies. No one would come to know the truth of her story until 20 years later, when Weir himself would confess to the incident. Grizel was also indicted for incest with her brother, which to me is unbelievable. She was the victim of these horrendous crimes, and had no choice in the matter. 
In her testimony, she had told of a great variety of places where the assaults had occurred over the years. And one time in particular, when in a barn at Wicket Shaw, her sister Margaret did enter and surprise them in the act. It was only after this that she revealed the meetings with the devil and the use of witchcraft. Weir, when asked of his guilt, told the court, I am guilty of all the foresaid crimes, and I cannot deny them. He was never charged with witchcraft or any form of sorcery. However, it is written in the records that when a minister came to the toll booth after the trial, so that Weir could confess his sins, the man would tell him that he did indeed talk with the devil in the evenings. There is also a passage in the records that details Grizel's hanging. When the woman tore off her clothes, she was heard to call out, I will die with all the shame I can. These are the heart-wrenching final words from a woman who was completely innocent and lived through more horror than can be possibly comprehended. Grizel, or Jean, is usually a second character in the tale of the Wizard of Westbo, and her true story of the 60-year nightmare she suffered at the hands of a sick, twisted, wretched individual is seldom told, and mostly overshadowed by interest in the occult and supernatural aspects of the story, a crime for which I must accept some guilt. This is the reason I have endeavoured to include the true story of Thomas Weir and the horror he inflicted on the women of Scotland. It is my belief that upon being questioned about her brother's crimes, and knowing how often his influence in the church and Edinburgh society had allowed him to continue his horrific abuse, that Grizel damned herself by telling the tales of witchcraft and devilry that would ensure both the death of her brother and herself. This was the tortured and tormented woman's only way of escaping a beast far more real and evil than the devil could ever be. Remember that Grizel was an innocent woman, put to the death for the crime of being a victim. The world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. <laughs>